Well, I think you've given us enough work to keep us busy for another 100 years. I loved how you ended that. I loved the reflection of the old is the new. I think about that a lot in my work. And, um, you know, I think a lot, a lot about what we talked about yesterday, too. I think the reflections that we made on where we are in our practice, in our work, we shared case studies, we talked about lessons learned, we talked about opportunities, and I think, Sasha, you created a whole conversation on opportunities. We talked about challenges, so today we're really talking about what's moving forward. We're talking about innovation, we're talking about ideas, and really how to put those into practice. So that's what my panel is going to be focused on today, and I'd like to invite my panel up. And while they're um, finding their seats, uh, unfortunately one of the panelists um, became ill, so she's not able to join us, Bettina, Bettina Ring. So I thought I'd take a few minutes of reflection myself and tell a short story. And I think it's funny that um, Sasha began with his home landscape. I'm doing the same. I'm beginning with my home landscape. Um, I didn't grow up in this country. I grew up in England in a very, very small village in the northern part. And my whole childhood was framed about being outside, was being about exploring. We didn't have a television. We didn't have a car. We really lived out in a very rural area, uh, 100 houses. And so my mornings were filled with, uh, when I wasn't in school, uh, clambering through hedge groves, going through fields, creeks. And I developed this insatiable desire to understand the natural world. And I think many of you probably have that same insatiable desire. And I grew up asking why a lot, because I was always curious about the natural world. And I think uh, my grandmother, to uh, both quench that thirst of asking why so much and probably just to quiet me down, bought me three volumes of a book that I still have, and it's a funny book when I was reflecting about it this morning. Um, it's called Tell Me Why. You may have had a similar book growing up. And that book, what it did is it cultivated a spirit of curiosity. And I think it really helped me innovate a certain mindset. And through that book, I spent hours learning about why do light bulbs turn on when you plug them in and have electric current? Why do some plants have medicinal uses and some don't? And I think I... In reflecting on that, I asked other questions like, why do some things go in that book and others don't? This is, yeah, this, I'm not taking you down my journey yet, trust me. Um, but in, in that reflection, I thought, well, there's lots of great ideas. What, why those ideas or why did those things go in that book? And I think in part, it was because those inventor, inventors, those people who created many of the things I read about, they used the seeds of innovation, and what they did was they experimented with those seeds, they applied those seeds, and eventually those seeds rooted, and some of them actually flourished. And what I was actually reading were the results of where innovation had actually been put into practice and results were in play. And I think that's a lot about our conversation today. We all innovate, every one of us, in our own way, and it's when we put it into practice and we take those risks and we take that creative spirit and we actually utilize it to have an outcome. And sometimes those outcomes aren't the best outcomes and we learn from them, but some of the times they really do stick and that advances our work. So fast forwarding almost 40 years from those fields where my grandmother would give me three volumes of 300 page books to keep me busy. I think in our work, there are many innovations we've already undertaken. There are things that we actually already have in our own book. And in reflecting, each of those continue to shape our work and they continue to advance our work. And today's conversations are really about what are those next chapters? How do we look to the old to build the new? And today, for me, I don't ask as much, tell me why. I think I would lose a lot of friends. I ask much more about what if, what if, and I think that's a great way to frame the conversation today because there are many what ifs. For me, what if speaks to the power of possibility. What if challenges us to be relevant? What if pushes us to adapt to changing needs and to get into areas that are very uncomfortable, but if we can push through them, can create really inspirational opportunities? And at times, the answers don't appear very quickly. Actually, I would suggest at times the answers often don't appear at all. But I invite you to take the journey of asking the question, 
trying to figure out what the que where the question takes you, and then from that, is there something you might not have seen if you hadn't asked the question, what if? So today's panel, I would suggest everyone sitting here has asked what if, and if you haven't, don't, you don't have to tell me. <laughs> and what you're gonna hear about is the things that they've asked what if around, and the things they're still asking what if as they look to the future. We're gonna hear about conservation as an integrated problem solver. We're gonna in hear about innovative public-private partnerships. We're gonna hear about bold experiments and collaboration that now are threatened by changing environments and changing politics. And we're gonna talk about engaging the power of marketplace. Sasha, I think it was really great you spoke to this too because it is some of those things that make us uncomfortable. But I would suggest what if we actually think about ways in which we can engage those conversations in a way that advances the work and the values we believe and brings in perhaps a broad audience to support our work. So with that for our panel, they're gonna be somewhat self-directed. <laughs> They'll introduce themselves and they're gonna speak for about five minutes each. And after that, I have three questions that I've put before the panel that we'll engage in and then offer the opportunity, hopefully if we have time, for all of you to be able to join us in conversation. So with that, I'm gonna turn this over to the first panelist. I think I need to give you this, Elsa. Oh, and perhaps we should have the, uh, what if I become the IT person? <laughs> I don't know if you want this, but we're gonna try. Uh, I first will have to find, don't worry, you guys can fill in for me. Um, sure. What if it works? <laughs> I'm really not trying to make you nervous at any point. <laughs> yes. Okay. Let me see if that works. This? I can advance your slides. Okay. I could start with my next story, but that might take us on a journey you might not want to go. Have you ever... Oh, does it work? Yes. Okay. All right, well, howdy and good morning, everybody. It's a delight to be here. I am Elsa Halbold. I'm the National Landscape Conservation Cooperative Network Coordinator, uh, and really pleased to be here and have enjoyed the discussions of the, la of the last two days. Uh, I'm gonna recap some of um, what we've already heard. You heard a brief overview yesterday from Gre Greg Wathen about what the LCCs are. I'm not gonna really repeat that. And as uh, uh, Sharon just alluded to, the future is, is really uncertain for the LCC network. The only thing certain, and I'll paraphrase Joanne, the only thing certain is change, and, and that is definitely coming for the LCC network. Um, we have a couple of LCC staff here. I hope you've had the opportunity to talk to at least one of them. We also have, I think, a few steering committee members from some of the 22 LCCs and three council members who I will name, Leslie Weldon from the Forest Service, Jad Daly from, now from uh, American Forests, and at the end of this esteemed panel, Jad, uh, Gary Tabor. So please make sure you have uh, the opportunity to talk to them. Uh, a couple years ago, the, uh, as, as Greg mentioned, the National Academy of Sciences was directed to do a study of the effectiveness of the LCC network. Uh, and they, one of the most powerful statements that came out of their study, and they had quite a few of those, was that there is a national need for landscape conservation. And I hope that everybody in this room saw that report and has taken that statement and is using it because, uh, again, I think this was, was a hugely powerful statement from, from the National Academy of Sciences. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about some of the innovations as, as uh, Sharon pointed out. There, um, 
This has been a grand experiment in, in collaboration, a seamless integrated network across uh, North America, some of Canada, some of Mexico, the entire Pacific Islands and the Caribbean Islands. And um, some of the recommendations in the National Academy of Sciences uh, included landscape design, we just heard Sasha talk about, um, and really developing better guidance for that. Uh, it talked about uh, developing a strong performance evaluation framework, which we have completed and we would like to share with folks in the future and really get input and feedback on, focused around two primary areas, the, the human side, which we heard about a lot about yesterday, as well as the ecological side. And, and again, would love, love to have some conversations with some of you in the future. We had uh, Pat Bixler was, was instrumental in helping us uh, with that at a workshop at the National Academies last summer uh, as well. So um, let me jump into some, uh, one, one other thing I want to make sure that you're aware of is that with these 22 LCCs and the network office itself, there have been many projects and products funded over the course of the last seven years. And we are just about ready to, well, and, and you can go to ScienceBase, which is a USGS platform, and um, in the next few weeks we will have every single project and product in that ScienceBase single catalog. In the past you've had to go to the 22 LCC websites, but now you can go to one stop shop and, and find all of that information and we're really super proud of that. It's been a, a Herculean effort of, of all of the staff to make that happen in a, in a much compressed time frame than we had originally planned. So uh, one of the things that, um, oh, this got mixed up somehow. Uh, CCAS was going to be on the bottom right because I was trying to show the geography of the, of the U.S. Greg talked about CCAS yesterday. Uh, this was, again, a request of the state Fish and Wildlife Agency directors in the southeast working with the, the federal leadership in the southeast to develop those high priority areas for conservation uh, for wildlife in the southeast. And it's really nice to have all of that in one place and to have that integration. They asked the LCCs to uh, put that together together. The Northeast, the North Atlantic LCC, and the 13 states up there uh, worked with the uh, North Atlantic LCC and did the same thing in the Northeast. And then the LCCs had a lot to do, spent over a million dollars in helping the states in the West develop the chat. So we are very close to having almost a seamless integrated, we can actually start stitching these pieces together and have a single map for wildlife conservation for the, for the entire United States. And I don't want to underemphasize, again, the social side. We heard a lot about this last year. I mean, yesterday, uh, this is a lot of the LCC staff, steering committees, and council members right here at NCTC working together, um, collaborating. A, a lot of what we hear when we've talked to state fish and wildlife agencies and, and others is the importance of the LCC network in that convening backbone function and allowing conversations to happen that have never happened before, that would not have happened and probably won't happen in the future unless unless there's someone there to be that convening function, that backbone. And, and these are some of the most absolute, most amazing people I've ever worked with in a very amazing career. And so, again, want to emphasize that. So I think I'll stop with that. A lot of innovation and tools in the LCC network and hope to uh, uh, have you involved in the change that is coming. So thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm Jen Thompson, and I am an assistant professor at the University of Montana in the Parks Tourism Recreation Program. And um, my passion for large landscape conservation actually stemmed from when I was in grad school working on my dissertation, which focused on what are the opportunities and challenges of large landscape scale um, conservation organizations and initiatives, and what are how does how do they really evolve over time? So instead of just looking at them as a snapshot, how do we actually look at the influencing factors, internal and external, that um, influence their success over time. And, and really learning from groups that have been around a while for how they can inform us on how we can learn more about and anticipate change for groups that are, um, you know, more recently starting up so that they're more resilient, um, you know, in the long term. 
So with that, today I'm actually going to be talking about um, some of my recent work, which has been with the Network for Landscape Conservation, which has basically been about studying all of you and your initiatives. Um, so a little bit of a different presentation, um, but in your folders you probably received um, this uh, little brief summary of some of the um, findings from this survey that went out to the practitioners in the Network for Landscape Conservation. And I'm just going to talk about some of those findings today um, and how they can kind of inform how the network can su better support you and your initiatives, um, but also how we can gain a greater understanding of how these initiatives work, um, the challenges they're, they're dealing with, and um, how they can be more resilient over time. So with that, um, we have a nice heat map here that was created, um, and this is not this does not include every single landscape um, scale initiative that is occurring in North America, but this is just from the responses in our survey. And it's just, a, I think, a good visual to kind of showcase where, where is a lot of this action happening? And even if we look around the room and where the participants are from here, um, you know, looking at not only where are we doing a lot of good work, but also where are gaps that we could do more? And I would love to kind of scale up this survey on an international scale also um, with other transboundary efforts around the world, because I think it can give us a good idea of what's happening, not just here in US, Canada, North America, but also on a global scale. Um, one of the questions we um, asked was about the top five uh, strategies or tools that initiatives are currently using to achieve their goals. And I'm just going to turn it here because I can see it a little bit better on uh this screen. So um, one of those is really about facilitating strategic conservation planning and information sharing, coordinating activities of partner groups. So, you know, a lot of this is not necessarily the on the ground work that we, you know, are trying to achieve, but it's also about this facilitation and having that, um, you know, forum for these partnerships to form kind of like what you were saying. So it's important for us to really know, um, you know, what we're about and the key roles that we play in, in the conservation world. Another question that was asked was the top challenges perceived by initiatives um, to really achieving these goals. So these are not challenges, conservation challenges, but actually what you're faced with um, when trying to achieve your goals. So of course, not surprising, funding, um, which we've talked about on and on, but I think we're, you know, the last presentation really gave us a lot of insight on. But what I think is also interesting was external social factors. So this was actually, we coded these, and these are the categories that came up. And what we mean by external social factors includes changes in demographics, um, social pressures, political changes um, that all kind of fall into there. Um, internal structure is more about changes in leadership, capacity of the groups internally. So it's, again, you're seeing the external and the internal as being very influential beyond just funding to the success of these initiatives. We also um, asked about the distribution um, and services for initiatives provided by the, um, the network for landscape conservation. So the network really wants to know what can they do for you? And this is really, this research is gonna help inform their strategic planning um, and also taking some of this data and making it into an interactive tool on their website so that you can all better connect and utilize these strategies um, better. But you can see that a lot of you said you wanna learn about others work through this network. Um, and that you also wanna increase the knowledge and skills through these resources connect with peers. So this is really informative to know how networks like this can better help connect all of you. We also asked, um, what is the motivation of participants to engage with other landscape um, initiatives? And so um, you can see the, the similar um, issues, goals, same geographic region. So a lot of you may have different reasons for actually working together. So that's important to know when we're thinking about the motivations behind um, partnerships and just being part of this network. And then this last slide, if you're looking and you go, whoa, that's always my first reaction to with uh, social network analysis and Patrick Bixler um, helps with this piece, but we really want to know how are all of you connected? 80% of you said that you were either nested within or are um, nested above, I guess you could say, with other initiatives in your landscape. So it's important to orient yourself. And this, and this is, I could go into a lot of detail and show so good Patrick on this analysis, um, but really 
the important theme is to look at the relationships and the brokers. So these are these are groups that are actually kind of the connectors between other groups. So if you have a lot going on in the network, which you can see that's happening, these brokers, these specific groups are kind of the connectors between them, the hubs. And so it's important to not only know who those brokers are, but also see where there could be future connections. Um, and that's maybe another way that the network for landscape conservation can help facilitate those um, relationships. So with that, I'll end, but I again just wanna, um, you know, I encourage you all to check out this um, executive summary also um, to, um, there's gonna be full reports available soon after um, this this forum. And we're also going to be using this data, like I said, on the website so that you can use it as an interactive tool. So thank you. Thank you, Jen. Good morning, everyone. I'm Joe Hankins. I work for the Conservation Fund. I'm vice president and uh, also uh, work right here in West Virginia. So thank you to Sasha for the great shout out uh, to West Virginia. This is home base for me. And uh, what an awesome opportunity to be here with the network, to be here with all of you, eat six square meals a day at NCTC. <laughs> And sleep in my own bed at night. It's just awesome. So uh, thank you for coming to Shepherdstown and not making me travel. Uh, talk a little bit about what the fund does. We are, as many of you know, uh, by nature, uh, transactional. Uh, we're the getter done kind of folks. Uh, we love the planning. We love the science. We love other people's priorities. But on the ground, uh, these plans have to be implemented. Parcels have to be identified, purchased, and financed. And uh, so we spent a lot of time thinking about those, those issues and those. Uh, so I wanted to talk today a little bit about maybe three trends that we see coming, uh, three trends that we're operating on now, and some quick examples of just things that we're working on uh, in, in the landscape. Uh, the first image here is uh, from our coastal forest work in, in Northern California. These are large landscape forests that we've helped conserve. But uh, the, the finance, you know, where does the capital come from from these projects? And in part, uh, this work is coming from carbon. Uh, we're able to sequester carbon and change the timber management. But quietly, one of the secrets behind those projects was debt, being able to borrow money from California state SRF funds uh, and doing water quality improvement for salmon habitat, coastal work there so the ability to borrow to take to take the big bets to take the the debt on and then to find alternative ways to finance these projects is is really critical and so we see that trend certainly uh the uncertainty and insufficiency it's always been insufficient let's face it but the uncertainty of federal funding going forward uh is really being met with creativity uh, alternate public funds alternate sources of public funds and private funds for sinking capital and uh, and impact investments, and so I think those are those are important issues. Uh, coastal landscapes uh, uh, saw some great and disturbing images of sea level rise, and uh, these coastal landscapes remind me very much of you know the Gretzky uh, quote of uh, how you know what's the secret to your success? Well, it's skating to where the puck is going to be, uh, and uh, and certainly in in the coastal world, we're seeing examples where we can no longer just count on conserving these landscapes uh, because of their absolute critical function. But we have to start thinking very, very critically about where those landscapes are migrating to, where that function is migrating to, and to start looking at our conservation work one meter up in the contour, uh, because that's where we're going to be a century from now. And as we're protecting uh, these landscapes, making sure that we're also protecting those habitat migration pathways, those landscape migration pathways. So those are some significant challenges. Home for, for many of us, these are uh, uh, wonderful places, but I think we're also seeing the increased sophistication of local land trust. We're working with accredited land trust. Uh, these groups are very sophisticated and provide an opportunity for a national organization like us to, to enter into joint ventures and, and collaborations and cooperation uh, with these landscapes, both in traditional and non-traditional ways. 
So I have a picture here of a farmer's market. Why is that relevant? Well, the conservation fund is actually in the business of lending money to land trusts for conservation acquisitions and lending money in, in, to non-traditional uh, opportunities. Why would we lend money for the farmer's market in Boston? Because that creates the value chain that allows the protection uh, of, of that uh, ex-urban uh, agricultural landscape. So without the farmer's market to sell the products, you can't produce, you can't save the landscape. And I think finally, uh, conservation is an integrated problem solver, both uh, uh, for floodplain and coastal protection and working forest landscapes, but also in the, in, in, in the social aspect bringing in uh, uh, voices into the movement that have not been present, uh, opening up conservation opportunities, both permanent and I think temporary in those landscapes and uh, making sure that we're communicating, collaborating and getting input uh, from all the folks uh, that have to be part of the picture going forward. So we're spending a lot of time thinking about that, trying to understand that. So those are the trends. Thanks a lot. Morning, everyone. My name is Mallory Dimmitt, and I'm wearing two hats today. I'm going to talk to you very briefly about each. So I previously was the executive director of the Florida Wildlife Corridor, and now I work for a private um, agribusiness in Florida as a, representing a large landowner. I'm going to talk to you first a little bit about the Florida Wildlife Corridor. And um, for those of you who haven't heard of us, the Florida Wildlife Corridor is a conservation, communications, and advocacy organization that is championing, championing the collaboration and public and private support needed to connect, protect, and restore a 16 million acre corridor of lands and waters spanning statewide across the state of Florida. So we're a tiny organization, and um, I really appreciated all the collaborative stories yesterday of more mature organizations, and Joanne's advice really is just to dive in, and uh, I think we've done that, and now we're sort of figuring out how we're going to sustain and uh, maintain sort of durability of this organization with this broad, big vision covering 46% of the state of Florida in a state where there are 20 million people, but we still have, as you can see, the, the sort of icons here of our um, migratory species and wide-ranging species that um, help tell this story. One of the other ways we help tell this story is through the use of expeditions. So those red dotted lines on this map actually show um, treks that were undertaken in 2012 and 2015 where myself and friends, uh, three other people, brave souls, we traveled from the Everglades to the Okefenokee, the number one and two largest wilderness areas in the eastern U.S., bookended this trip that was a thousand mile, hundred day journey through the connected lands that are part of this wildlife corridor. Um, so not only the public lands, but we have incredible um, credibility with private landowners that gave us this opportunity to cross their lands and tell their stories about why they're interested in, in the survival of this wildlife corridor. So we also um, repeated that in 2015, where we started at the midway point in the um, newly designated but not yet fully protected Everglades Headwaters National Wildlife Refuge and Conservation Area in the center of the state working our way around the Big Bend and ultimately to Alabama. Both of our, border, our treks crossed into Georgia and down the Alabama border to make that point that wildlife doesn't and, and nature doesn't recognize those boundary differences. And so um, we, you know, even the map use and our um, non-partisan, non-political approach is key here. I really like the idea yesterday when someone said, you know, what is the mission of one of the groups was agriculture. And I've been thinking about that. It's certainly important. Food and fiber comes from here in the Florida Wildlife Corridor. But really, our organization's mission, and as a convener, I think, is storytelling. And so <laughs> maybe if we can all work that into our, um, our efforts. Um, and sort of how we do that. Um, is through high quality visual communications with great production value. Not unlike the high divide you saw last night, we've actually used the same filmmaker to um, showcase our, our region and the corridor through this film for PBS. It's called The Forgotten Coast, came out this year, aired everywhere in Florida, but also um, all the way to Anchorage, Alaska. So you could, you could learn about the Florida Wildlife Corridor on television, but also in your newspaper, on your radio, 
all over social media, blogs, and in every possible way. One of the white papers said documentaries is not enough, and I agree with that, although they're a great starting place and a way to reach a lot of people. So I'll move a little more quickly. Um, the Florida black bear has seven distinct subpopulations in the state of Florida. It's been a very useful tool for us. The Florida Wildlife Corridor expeditions actually follow in the footsteps of the Florida black bear. That was the inspiration for the expeditions. But this also ties um, to my work now because this image of this black bear from this, one of the same conservation photographers involved in the wildlife corridor is actually on private lands owned and operated by Likes Brothers, a, a fifth generation family agribusiness that um, has a diversified ag operations, but is interested in conservation easements and in payments for ecosystem services as part of its business strategy and for the future. So my job as the fifth generation of this family, is, the company has been around for more than 100 years, is to plan where we're going for the next 50. It's a great challenge, and, um, and nature conservation is part of that business strategy. So this bear is on an, an property called Ingram's Crossing that's on the state's two land conservation programs in their highest tier for protection. And we're hoping that we'll be able to achieve this easement in, in the next two years that will add to the 44,000 acres we already have in, under conservation easement and owned and operated by Likes Brothers. We also work in um, payment for ecosystem service projects. So this is an aerial view of a water project called the Nicodemus Slough. It's a public-private partnership with the Southwest, South Florida Water Management District. This is on the western edge of Lake Okeechobee. It's 16,000 acres in size. We're able to store here excess surface water that is equivalent of 77,000 households water use for the year. So, you know, Florida has either too little or too much water at any given time, mostly too much. And um, this is a low-tech but a highly effective solution that we need scattered across the landscape. This is an average two-foot depth to restore, you know, hold water on former uh, wetlands, essentially, that were drained and diked for agriculture years ago. And so I think it's these kind of innovative approaches um, that we can scale up really quickly. We're told that we need a million acres of this kind of dispersed water storage north of Lake Okeechobee to make a dent in, uh, in holding water back from the lake and ultimately from being released to tide. And um, it's a triple win for the landowner, the state, and um, residents and flood control. So that was a quick overview, and thank you very much. Hello, everybody. I'm Paul Tryanowski. I'm the Chief Conservation Officer at the Sustainable Forestry Initiative. And uh, many of you may know about who we are, but I'll tell you a little bit about that as well. Let me say first, it's such an honor to be here. What an esteemed group of people this is. And several people have said that, and it's really true. And looking out across the audience at uh, so many people that I know and recognize and have admired over the years is a real honor for me to be a part of it. Um, so the Sustainable Forestry Initiative is a nonprofit organization that operates in the, uh, in the area of sustainable supply chains as well as sustainable communities and, uh, and of course, sustainable forests. Um, and also in the areas of environmental education. And my work specifically is around ensuring conservation outcomes in working forest lands. And we have, uh, within SFI's uh, uh, rubric, we have 285 million acres of certified forest lands under our uh, under uh, management in the U.S. and Canada. They're not owned by us, but they ascribe to our standards. And so there's an opportunity there, I think. Oh, this thing is just running on without us, isn't it? How interesting. All right. <laughs> Gary, you were. All right, Gary. So. Uh, well, I'm the future. <laughs> <laughs> Gary is the future, he says. Um, all right. I did want to just uh, show some pictures of, uh, as I talk, just something for you to look at and remind us of why we're all here. These are some of the working forest lands that are, in fact, certified under the SFI standard and just uh, something nice to look at as we talk about other greater, bigger ideas as well. Uh, so I just want to mention, I so appreciated Sasha's comments uh, this morning because uh, they were so focused on creative approaches and reaching beyond the traditional ideas. 
It's really important that we continue to use and implement traditional strategies for land protection, uh, conservation easements, acquisitions, I get all that, but that also leaves a great deal of what we think of as landscapes that uh, may not be addressed by those specific strategies, and I think it's really important that we think creatively about that, and so I thought the setup this morning was perfect in getting us to think about that. We have to be increasingly creative about what partnerships we employ, what tools we utilize in order to really achieve scale in landscapes. And of course, my brain always goes to forests, but of course these landscapes are usually diverse and complex and they include a lot of different things. And a lot of those lands are in fact private lands that we have to think about how are we going to conserve those or have them become a constructive part of our overall outcomes that we're seeking to attain. And so um, it's important that we think about those uh, partnerships uh, creatively and constructively. So these private landowners constitute a great proportion of many of these landscapes. And there's been a lot of great work done, particularly with smaller landowners, I would say, uh, by folks like the NRCS, uh, the American Tree Farm System, and uh, the U.S. Forest Service through their state and private forestry uh, work and the state, uh, the state agencies that work in forest lands in particular. And a lot of stuff going on in the agricultural sector that I don't know as much about, uh, but I know that there is great work going on there as well. But one of the things that I thought would be useful to talk about and just bring some focus to are large institutional landowners. We heard Jimmy Bullock talk a little bit about this yesterday. It enables us to engage relatively few decision makers in uh, talking about conservation outcomes at a relatively large scale. And so those institutional landowners provide a really unique opportunity to get some real leverage for conservation outcomes. But there are some challenges associated with that as well. But I do want to point out that one of the reasons why they constitute such an important opportunity is because they are linked to the marketplace. Uh, they're primary producers. They are uh, responsive to the sustainability goals of their customers. And so they create a, new, a unique opportunity to bring the power of the marketplace to bear on pulling those conservation outcomes down through the system and helping to facilitate uh, those outcomes. So brand owners downstream, when you look at the uh, evening television shows and you see all the name brands that you recognize being advertised uh, on TV, those brand owners all have sustainability goals and they are responsive to that because their customers, that is the folks on the street, want sustainability. When uh, we heard mention this morning of the um, uh, the bond issues that, that are universally successful over and over again. The reason for that is because the public wants conservation outcomes. And so that reverberates in the marketplace and creates opportunity in terms of, in my case, managed forest lands and maybe in other uh, arenas as well. Customers care about conservation and that creates opportunity and need for landscape practitioners to uh, be able to address those, uh, those ideas through their management and uh, in fact an obligation that they have to, to get it done. So I want to challenge all of us to think creatively about, about those conservation outcomes, particularly in managed forest lands, but in other kinds of managed lands that exist in these landscapes that we care about. I think we need to learn how to celebrate the conservation values, how to learn how to engage different tools and different partnerships to motivate those conservation outcomes and try to uh, get everything that, that all of us care about, including even consumers that may not understand uh, the degree of their own interest or how that could be manifested in the marketplace. Um, there are a lot of examples. Maybe we'll get a chance to talk about that through the questions. I don't want to go into those too much right now. Uh, but I just want to challenge all of us to think about uh, engaging the power of the marketplace in terms of the interests of the, of the American people in, in providing these kinds of outcomes. Think about how that can affect our strategies, how it should affect our partnerships, and how we can harness that to, uh, to gain those outcomes and, and provide some leverage that we may not have thought about before. Thank you. Will I have to say next, or will it run? I think we're all good. OK, we're all good? OK. I'm Gary Tabor. Um, I'm uh, from the Center for Large Landscape Conservation in Bozeman, Montana. Um, that's a boring name for an organization that does not, um, is not hired out to do m a mowing of grand estates. Um, we don't do any kind of large-scale landscaping. Um, we're not a top-down, you know, this is the way the world is, large landscape organization. 
We call ourselves the Center for Large Landscape Conservation because we help people and communities make better conservation decisions at the scale nature functions. So we try to help people make decisions beyond the scale that they normally do based on their culture, geography, jurisdiction. In collective action speak, um, we are a, um, we support and create backbone organizations. And we are the fiscal sponsor of the Network for Landscape Conservation, which is one of the many networks that we support. And when I think about networks, we are in the age of networks. We are in the age of the social network, as we all know, network science. You don't see single authored papers anymore. We're in the age of network governance, network communication, and network organizations. So when you think about the future, the way we even do conservation is changing because the ground beneath us is changing in terms of how we interact with each other. So here's my thesis to you, and in this place where many of the great conservation uh, icons uh, of our nation are, are strewn throughout this facility, America's greatest idea in 1872, the 19th century, was the American National Park, the National Park. And I would say that in the 20th century, that idea expanded to the ecosystem-based conservation or ecosystem concept. And I believe in the 21st century, the greatest idea is going to be process conservation. And when I mean process conservation, it's everything from pollination to fire ecology to water management, hydrology, to dealing with climate resilience. Because right now we're dealing with the life functions of how nature works. And part of that process conservation is connectivity. Because I believe connectivity conservation is where all this effort from ecosystem services to protection to carbon sequestration are all nested in this area of connectivity, which connects protected areas in the matrix of multi-jurisdictional, multi-use lands. So given um, that uh, um, we are facing uh, cumulative impacts of, of humanity and climate change, I believe the health of the planet is at risk. And as a result, we are tinkering with the functional ecology of nature if we don't pay attention to process conservation. Dire implications not only for biodiversity, but also for people's livelihoods. Now, this report may not have come to your attention, but it's a big deal. Because last, this year, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, the 200 largest international corporations in the world, came out with a call to action to address landscape connectivity. Because in not addressing connectivity in their business models is undermining their business practice. Whether you work in agriculture or transportation, or whether you're shipping packages around the world or the footprint of your organization is now growing into huge parks outside of rural areas in Bentonville, uh, Arkansas, your impact on the landscape is now impacting the, your, your bottom line. And this is where we are failing in terms of our policy and for government uptake. When the business community says, this is an environmental problem, and we in government or in other sectors are not listening to that problem, we have an issue. Connectivity conservation, I believe, is the circulatory system of nature. Protected areas of the organs, the heart, the lungs of nature. But we are failing to protect the connectivity between them. And connectivity, I believe, is not only the embodiment of all that we talk to about these innovations, it is also the architecture of large-scale conservation. And it is a process that's not only happening here in North America, it is going global. And just like the business community is looking at this as a global problem, there are other efforts around the world that are going global. This is a represent representation of 150 large-scale conservation efforts that are bottom-up around the world. And they want to connect to the people in this community. And some of them are represented here in North America. But this is a growing, this is a growing conservation movement that is disconnected from each other. But at working at large scale, trying to address the ultimate scale issue of the health of the planet. The World Commission on Protected Areas sees that there is no kind of consistent practice for connectivity conservation. It's ad hoc all over the place. 
and we need measurable targets. And when we think about trying to get to 50% for nature or um, up our game or have ambitious targets for protected areas or saving nature, connectivity now has to be part of that equation. And so in response, the World Commission on Protected Area has created a new group, which I chair, Jody Hilty is the deputy chair, called the Connectivity Conservation Specialist Group. And it's to bring all that talent together. And one of our goals with connectivity conservation is to create a new conservation designation called Areas of Conservation Designation. And for the next year, we are going to be bringing this new concept out around the world. This is the first kind of major forum that we're introducing this concept to. It's spatially explicit. And what it is, it's a 1.0. The connectivity conservation has to have some kind of standards, has to have some kind of guidance, and has to be built upon and improved because we're dealing with the messy middle in conservation, the messy middle between protection, between nature and humans. And how do we do this in a way that's compatible not only for human livelihoods, but to, for the protection of all the ecological fu functions that sustain the planet? Thank you. Well, as you can see, there's a lot of forward thinking in this group. So let's give our panel a big hand, and then we're going to transition to questions. Thank you. I thought I'd write the questions down, too, because I don't know about you. Sometimes I'm listening to the question, and I get involved in the answer, and then I forget the question. Maybe you don't have my, my uh, short-term memory. So the first question. and. And I've asked some of the panelists specifically to speak to this, and I know we have about 25 minutes. So our landscapes are becoming more complicated. I think this whole forum has really illustrated that. We have increasing populations, we have changing climates, limited funding, and varied use of our natural areas and resources. So I'm going to start with actually Gary, since you finished, I'll start with you. What models do you envision for landscape conservation in the future? Maybe you could build a little off of what you said. What do they look like? But I guess for you specifically, what will it take to get us there in the next five to 10 years? Well, I don't think there's going to be a top-down approach to solving these problems. I believe the bottom-up approach has to be scaled up to address the scale that nature functions. I believe organizations like the Network for Landscape Conservation is one of many of the networking entities institutionally that are trying to scale up human endeavors in this realm. It's not going to take 100% of the planet to save the planet. It may take 10% of us, maybe it's 5% of us, but we have to connect that 5% of the planet to do so. And I believe that we have the tools now. Process conservation has always been the boring conservation because we wanted to see a product at the end. But you cannot have the kind of ambitious products we want now unless you invest in process conservation. And I believe that's where the action is because it's going to connect the capacity because we're in a low capacity, low financial kind of environment of working with bigger challenges on our plate. And unless we have this kind of connective work, I don't believe, or connective support, interstitial support, you would call it, I don't believe we're going to be able to do this without having that um, kind of framework. Great. And I'm sure, Elsa, this is something that you're thinking about quite a bit, given the transitions. So I'm wondering if perhaps you can speak to you know, your thoughts around the future about what landscape conservation will look like and specifically how we get there in the next five to 10 years. Sure, thanks. Um, and very similar to what Gary said, you know, the bottom-up approach is really important. Um, all conservation is really local. Uh, we've heard sort of inklings of it the past two days, but the, the real importance of um, better integration of the social science in particular and, and having that definitely help lead the pack. And, and we've also heard a lot, and I know there's a lot of jargon being passed around here about the collective impact concept and, and the importance of the backbone organization and, and having that creation of those of those backbone organizations I think is going to be really important and and as Gary said it's going to take the people to make this happen I mean that's that's how we're going to get there is the the identified need there was a little bit of discussion in the first panel yesterday about having that shared crisis that we need to rally around to to help us get there um, you know times are changing and and you know as Joanne uh, pointed out we, we are just going to have to constantly be changing and evolving and um, and and be nimble and flexible as as we move forward and Paul 
I would suggest you have very similar outcomes, but perhaps a different approach. So I'm curious from your perspective, what do you see? Yeah, well, I think it's important to note, um, I do think that there's uh, power in, uh, in what we think of as conservationists, the non-traditional place, uh, and that is maybe the marketplace to help motivate the outcomes we all desire and make those connections. But, but I, would, I would point out very quickly that it has to build on the suggestions that have just been made about the networking of uh, conservation organizations, the ability to draw in um, other non-traditional kinds of, uh, of uh, sectors uh, like social responsibility, for example, and, and um, you know, human need and human health in order to link those things effectively. Um, so one of the things that has to happen, even if, uh, and I'll mention a couple examples in a moment about what's going on in forestry, but, but in order for all this to really work, it has to entail the building of understanding in people, uh, whether they represent corporations or whether they represent individuals on the street that have the power of, uh, the buying power to help motivate action. Uh, they have to have an understanding that their actions really can reverberate meaningfully into uh, all the way back to uh, the forest and, uh, and to motivate those kinds of outcomes. So there's a lot of communication and understanding building that is going to be necessary in order to create those outcomes. But I'll mention very quickly, there are a few things going on in the forestry sector that are attempting to build in these linkages between the marketplace and motivating conservation outcomes. So for example, uh, the Forest Service is leading a, an effort called Keeping Forests as Forests in the U.S. South, starting in the U.S. South, hopefully in the long run, maybe uh, broader. But it's really interesting because uh, the idea is to try to find ways to ensure the perpetuation of, of forest cover at, at a bare minimum uh, across the U.S. South at a multi-million acre scale. But to do that, they're engaging folks like the Center for Disease Control and, and uh, other kind of uh, social and human health interests in devising the strategies that might uh, come out that way. Uh, similarly, the, uh, uh, the American Forest Foundation has a forest of focused effort, which is attempting a direct link to brand owners and using the power and, and frankly, the dollars of those brand owners to help motivate conservation outcomes in landscapes. And so, uh, and these are managed forest landscapes. In our own work, uh, the Sustainable Forestry Initiative has a, an effort underway that we call conservation impact, which is attempting to better understand the conservation-related outcomes that are accruing from that 285 million acre footprint of certified forest lands and trying to translate that into ways that the marketplace can be responsive to or is more attuned to. And so uh, outcomes in regards to conservation of uh, water resources, biodiversity, climate change, mitigation values, and the like. As we transition to our next question, I think I could suggest that all of you spoke to engaging people, whether it's bottom up, needing to have networks, and building relevancy. So as we look at our next question, and I'll start with you, Joe, on this one, how do we increase the relevancy and practice of landscape conservation given the different land management and societal interests? I mean, we've been talking about those juxtapositions throughout this whole forum. How do we appeal and demonstrate value in both the urban and rural context? context and their constituencies, and how do we better link the concept and practice of landscape conservation to quality of life? Easy questions. <laughs> we spend the whole day, but just your insights. Yeah, you know, I, I, I think it's, it, it, it's a challenge working, but I, I think the fundamental practice of conservation is, is local, and trying to find that, uh, that local connection when we work on a project, when we're in this uh, aggressive incrementalism mode where we're working on pieces of, of a larger plan, uh, how do we articulate the value of that incremental step? Uh, how do we place uh, uh, that landscape or the, the folks involved in that larger plan? And how, how do, they, do they see themselves in the conservation work? And so I think that's the fundamental challenge here is uh, I, I think we, we've seen it, it, in, in overarching themes, you know, Americans fully support conservation. They're willing to tax themselves and, and fund these efforts. But then at the local level, how do, we make that, how do we make that relevant? How do we make that inclusive? And I think that does get to the, to the urban uh, and rural constituency divide. Uh, if we saw anything from the big news yesterday, and that's not that you have 280 characters in Twitter, but it, the big news yesterday is look at, look at the maps, look at the demographics of the, 
of the outcomes of the election, and it is very blue and red, uh, it, it, and it's very urban and rural. And so we have to find ways to, to connect the demographics, to, to connect the hopes and aspirations of people to conservation. And uh, that requires listening. We've talked about that, that collabor collaborative effort. And uh, it, it has been said, I've, I've been told that the, uh, the poison to collaboration is politeness. And, uh, and I think that we have, in order to collaborate, we truly have to listen. We have to listen to things that maybe we don't want to hear or seek out those opinions and try to find those connections. So somehow we have to bridge that. We have the elements before us. Uh, you know, we, we have the landscape. We understand these functions. We, we see these connections increasingly well. Uh, how do we put the people, how do we put, put our work in that? And, and it's a challenge that we're going to have to continue to work on. Great, and Mallory, maybe you could also touch upon it since you have multiple hats. Yep. Um, I think this is a key question, and the tagline of our organization is connecting to keep Florida wild. That's hashtag keep Florida wild, just so you can put it short in Twitter. But, but the connecting part of that is what is really key. And so not only do we work to amplify the messages uh, from our partners and really to reach and connect with decision makers, um, but we find that people are seeking authentic experiences and authentic stories and really the people behind them. Um, they want to connect and do something for the protection of the corridor. Our challenge has really been about the organizational capacity simply to be able to provide that next level of engagement. So there's a huge opportunity there, I think, for people who are really seeking connection. Um, and one of the ways we do that is really demonstrating or sort of showing through our communications how, how connectivity provides for quality of life. So it's not enough to talk about it, but it is enough to sort of demonstrate it. And I think right now there's a real opportunity around stories of resili resiliency. So how nature and conserved areas have saved life, property, or help preserve quality of life um, is sort of the key moment in storytelling at, at this point. So we talked a little bit this morning, Sasha mentioned about healthcare and wellness. I think that's a hugely undertapped sort of part of our storytelling and specifically, I dislike the word ecotourism, but um, tourism around wellness is, is going to be key to the success and to the preserving ways of life and diversifying the economy in, um, in these rural areas that make up our connected landscapes. Um, so certainly think about um, agritourism and, and wellness tourism to bring people to rural communities. The amenities around them are, are part of an economic driver. And how can communities really control that process in a way that is authentic, real, and part of their goals? Thank you. Paul, do you want to touch upon it and then maybe? Yeah, so, uh, so uh, my friends and colleagues here have said it much better than I could, I think. Uh, so I'll just underscore a couple of things. Um, it is about storytelling and about building relevancy to those audiences. And so I think that's really, really important. We have a project right now where we're working with a, a nonprofit organization called Green Blue to try to translate down through the supply chain the relevancy of conservation work on the ground and the relevancy of, uh, frankly, you know, critters and clean air and, and uh, climate change mitigation down through the supply chain, uh, ultimately those messages will be translated in such a way that they have relevance to people. You know, and I kid about, and there are no such plans, so I don't want to be quoted this way, but I kid about having, you know, a picture of a frog on the back of a pizza box. You know, the pizza box comes from a forest that helps conserve habitat for the frog. And if you can, if you can try to make those examples real and tell those stories in ways that exert relevancy uh, for the people that are at the other end of the supply chain or the general public in the case of, um, of uh, state and federal agencies that are trying to coordinate this work and use tax dollars to motivate those outcomes, which I think is equally important, then uh, you, know, you have to find ways to translate those actions in ways that have relevancy and immediacy to the people that, uh, that can offer that support. Very important. I'll just tell a quick story in the sense that uh, I, uh, Mo in Montana, you have access to your politicos. And uh, I was in DC flying back to Montana and uh, happened to be uh, sitting next to Senator Daines. 
and it's all kind of awkward to sit next to someone you didn't vote for. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but we struck up a, a conversation about conservation and, and about collaborative conservation. And what resonated is that we were coming home after the shooting in uh, Northern Virginia at the baseball field where someone had a different political opinion of another and, and took it out with, with weaponry. And I've said, you know, this is what collaborative conservation is, you know, doing. In a time when there's so much divisiveness in our country, you know, here's a tried and true process of getting people to talk to each other from different cultures and different points of view. Isn't this going to be the way you, don't look at this as conservation. This is about building civil society or building civility back in our country. Isn't this the right thing to do? Isn't this where you want to invest in? Mr. Chair of the National Parks Committee of the, of the <laughs> U.S. Senate appropriations. And so I believe it is. And I think that, you know, when it comes to relevancy, I think now more than ever people want to have a civil dialogue. I think conservation is a great platform for that. Thank you. I mean, that is a pretty big, you know, statement. Like, what if our work is relevant to all of our constituents in 10 years. That would be a huge, huge undertaking and a, a great milestone to achieve. So our last question, um, given the fact that Sasha gave us such a list of innovative opportunities that we're going to be pursuing over the next 10 to 15 years, and some of those are already in play, and many of you have actually undertaken work in this context, in your experience, what are the key ingredients that have helped you turn innovation into practice in this field. And please share an example specific to your work and perhaps even a story of how. So we'll start here with you, Elsa. So I, I, I had something else, um, and I, I'll get to that, but I'm reminded of something that uh, Kristen said yesterday about um, not thinking about the end goal of conservation, but what is, how is it, and she comes from the military, DOD, uh, what is it that conservation can do to help you achieve your mission and your goal? And again, thinking about, and, and a word I haven't used is diversity, but uh, you know, the diversity, and we need to reach out to the transportation sector and make sure we're working with the D DOD and make sure that the government is working with private landowners, and I love to see um, those folks here. But I, I think what's really important and, and again, I feel like a broken record here is getting everybody together, and um, Steve said this yesterday, you have to have a shared vision. If you don't have that shared vision, you're not gonna accomplish anything, and, and, and that's absolutely right on. And, and for the, the science end of things, working with those end users, don't just give them a tool and leave it at the loading dock and run off, but work with them in, from the beginning to the end, get their input. What is it that they need that's gonna help them do their job better? Um, Co-develop those tools, and again, don't just leave it at the loading dock. Work with them on the back end to make sure they know how to use it and, and that it's working. And if it's not, then fix it and, and make it something that does, does help them. And I, I think that um, some of the, the, the landscape designs that I showed, the Nat Nature's Network and the Appalachian LCC um, are both, and, and uh, the South Atlantic, a lot of the LCCs are really working with and having workshops with um, with their constituents, with the members of the LCC, and, and showing them how to use the tools. And it's so neat to sit in. I was at the North Atlantic a couple of, last year and watching 30 representatives from different state fish and wildlife agencies learn how to use the tools and getting really excited about how they were gonna use that information back home to help them conserve wildlife, so. Well, when I first saw this question, I saw ingredients, I immediately thought of cooking, which then made me think, oh boy, Jen in the kitchen is not a good idea. <laughs> um, and you know, when I think of ingredients, and if any of you do really love cooking or have cooked, it's really not about the ingredients, but it's really knowing how much of each ingredient, when's the most appropriate time to come in, what mixes, what doesn't mix, um, to really get that final meal or product. And so I encourage us all, when we're talking about these key ingredients, to think about the context that you work in and really knowing that recipe and that the recipe may shift depending on what that meal is over time. So keeping that in mind, but I do have a couple ingredients I wanted to share, um, five actually. One is to 
recognize that we're nested. So constantly orient yourself and your organization in your landscape and the network um, that you're in and really thinking about what are ways you and your group can complement other group's goals versus compete with them for funding or other resources. Another is we've heard a lot about the importance of relationships and social capital, and that this is really the foundation to achieve a lot of our goals. But unfortunately, that's also an intangible success. And when we live in a time of bean counting and outputs and funders and people who want to see these metrics, it can be very difficult to demonstrate those things. So it's important for us to really recognize the importance of that to achieving our goals, but also thinking about how can we demonstrate that success and that it is really important to achieving all our goals. Um, third is don't put all of our eggs in one basket. So that can go for funding. Um, that can also go for leadership. If you put all of your resources in one single leader, um, when that person leaves or retires, you may be in a very vulnerable position. So thinking about how can we share that governance, that leadership model, and also diversifying funding, and even how do we adapt our missions over time. Fourth, um, we're in here for the long game. And I thought about yesterday when we were thinking, you know, short term is within five years, long term is greater than five years. But what about if the long game is decades, centuries from now? So I challenge us all to really think about what that long game means. And that it's not just thinking about where we are now, but where are we going? So going back to the puck example, where is that puck going? Um, and then lastly, I've heard this a lot um, that oftentimes collaboration at this scale is seen as a luxury and not a necessity. So when budgets are cut and people are restricted with travel, one of the first things is, well, you can no longer collaborate with this other group or travel to these types of meetings. And that's to really, um, I challenge us all to make each of what we do and the things that we're doing here um, these couple of days is that we need to transition that from being a luxury to a necessity in order to continue these efforts. Great, I think we're close to being out of time, but one more? Okay, thank you, Jen. Go ahead, Joe. Ooh, that's uh, tense. I think uh, <laughs> all, all of us uh, have had those moments, and for me, um, was about a year ago standing on a mountaintop removal post mine reclamation site in southern West Virginia, listening to an outgoing governor talk about elk reintroduction and, and uh, the future of a landscape. Uh, in the coal fields that was converting from resource extraction to a more sustainable model of working forests and wildlife and tourism. And looking around and seeing a uh, bitter cold day, muddy, seeing several hundred people, lots of kids out of school, everybody in camo, celebrating the, the elk reintroduction and celebrating uh, a change in a landscape that was industrial and private and, and, uh, and fenced off to now a landscape that's owned by the state of West Virginia. It's open to the public. Uh, and the hope in that community that that landscape change uh, would change their fortunes, change their future in the southern part of the state. So I think that, that we're all challenged uh, to, to look at those landscapes, to look at those opportunities differently, to, to uh, uh, have some hope and, and, and recognize that if we listen uh, and we do the good work, we're embedded in the communities, uh, that good things can happen, and, and that's, uh, that's an, a generational shift in attitude in southern West Virginia that, uh, that we're proud of and I think is an opportunity for the future. Well, great. Well, I, I know we've come to a close in our time, but I invite you all to continue these conversations amongst yourselves. We have two more really...